Great, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, just a brief introduction of myself. My name is Laura Paul, and, and I'm uh, um, assistant professor here at Dartmouth Hitchcock in pulmonary and critical care medicine. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Susan Annenberg. Um, she's an associate professor at the School of Public Health at George Washington University and the director of the George Washington Climate and Health Institute. She did her undergraduate training at Northwestern University and received her master's and PhD in environmental science, engineering, and environmental policy at University of North Carolina School of Public Health. She's held numerous positions at various agencies, including the US EPA, the US Department of State, and the National Academy of Sciences. She currently serves on the US EPA's Science Advisory Board and Clean Air Act Advisory Committee, the World Health Organization Global Air Pollution and Health Technical Advisory Group, and the National Academy of Sciences Committee to advise the US Global Change Research Program. Her background and expertise has led to extensive research that has advanced the field of climate change and policy and has been funded by various agencies, including NASA, NOAA, and the EPA. Her work has been published in leading journals, including Lancet Planetary Health, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Environmental Health Perspectives, and Nature. We are very lucky to have Dr. Annenberg join us today to discuss her work on the relationships between air pollution, climate change, and public policy. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Laura, and thank you all for having me here and showing up today. It's a real pleasure to talk with you all. I'm gonna try to go ahead and share my slides here. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna be talking about how climate change, air pollution, public health, and environmental justice intersect, and also discuss some policy implications as you noted from my bio, I have a lot of uh, ties to sort of the policy community and seek to develop science that can directly inform policy. So I hope that you um, come away from this uh, talk today with uh, just the understanding that, you know, a lot of this work is done directly with policy stakeholders um, and for the purpose of informing their work to improve health for people. Um, so we're not doing science just for science sake, we're doing very targeted research to make decision making more informed by evidence. So I just want to uh, thank many of the, the funders who have contributed to uh, making this work possible. And I'm going to talk about some key points today. First is that air pollution continues to place a large burden on public health globally and even in the US where we think we have dramatically improved our air pollution and we have. Uh, we still have some challenges here in the U.S. and that these air pollution related health risks vary within cities. So even though air quality has improved throughout the United States since the Clean Air Act, the uh, air pollution related health risks that are remaining are, are very much inequitably distributed. And that's driven by both concentrations and the vulnerability of the people breathing those concentrations, the disease rates that uh, people are, are uh, dealing with and living with that are contributing to whether or not they uh, survive uh, air pollution exposure and how they fare. And that contributes to health inequity. Third, that air pollution may worsen in the future under climate change, and actually it will be harder to improve our air quality in the future and ensure that people have safe air to breathe uh, uh, because of the risk factor multiplier that is that is climate change. And we'll talk about some of the ways that climate change exacerbates air pollution. The fourth key point is that future air quality management really requires a shift from engineering controls. These are things that we have relied on in the past throughout the United States, you know, catalytic converters on, on our passenger vehicles and diesel particulate filters on our trucks and buses and scrubbers on our power plants. These are engineering controls that are very effective at taking emissions out of the effluent stream. Um, but they are not doing anything for, for cli climate change. And so greenhouse gases are just continuing largely unabated. And if we were to actually reduce the amount of fuel that is burned, we would also experience many local and immediate benefits for public health in addition to global long-term climate benefits. And then finally, the health sector really has a critical role to play here. First of all, ensuring that patients are aware of how their environment affects their health. Secondly, treating air pollution and climate change as the health emergencies that they are. And then finally, advocating for policies that will reduce health risks from air pollution and climate change. Without policies, we will not be able to ensure that people have uh, safe air to breathe. So I just want to start with a development in the past uh, couple of years that 
you know, one challenge that this field of, of air pollution and health risks has had is that, um, you know, we, we understand that air pollution is contributing to premature mortality. And yet, because of the way we code mortality in the United States and really everywhere around the world, um, we are only coding the cause of death. That would be, say, cardiovascular disease or a heart, you know, a heart attack or COPD or something like that. We don't say, you know, on the death certificate, air pollution uh, contributed to the uh, disease that this person experienced that led to their death. That really changed with um, with this child here who unfortunately passed away um, a couple years back. She was eight, same age as my son. And she was admitted to the hospital 27 times over a three-year period with life-threatening asthma, including three spells in intensive care. And she had been treated in five separate hospitals, but no medical professional had ever explained that air pollution could be making her asthma worse. And it was just decided in December 2020 that um, air pollution would be added to her medical cause of death. So you see one C there, air pollution exposure. And the narrative conclusion is that she died of asthma contributed to by exposure to ex excessive air pollution. And so, you know, what you're going to see me today talk about a lot of statistics, but it is not statistics that is actually happening in reality. These are real people, real children who, um, who lives are brought short by air pollution exposure. Um, and, you know, the, it's, it's affecting people across the age spectrum and across, the, across all walks of life. Um, so let's talk about the different uh, diseases that are associated with major air pollutants. PM 2.5 or fine particulate matter is the largest contributor to the burden of disease from air pollution. And the most recent EPA integrated science assessment for particulate matter this is about a thousand page document that the EPA uh, writes every time one of these major air pollutants goes through a review cycle for setting the national ambient air quality standards. The integrated science assessment is a systematic review of the epidemiological literature, toxicology, human studies, um, really the entire human health evidence basis. And they have a framework for deciding whether um, each individual air pollutant is causally or likely to be causally associated with each health outcome. So these are just the, the um, health outcomes that I've listed here are those that are uh, that have been in the most recent ISA uh, uh, decided to be either causally associated or likely to be causally associated with these air pollutants. So you can see for PM 2.5 that includes cardiovascular, respiratory effects, nervous system effects, cancer, and premature mortality. For ozone, it's mostly respiratory, although there is a bit of a gray area right now because um, there was a likely to be causal association in the, uh, the I guess, the, the penultimate, the preceding ISA for ozone prior to the 2020 ISA, um, and that was downgraded in the 2020 ISA, and similar for mortality. So we'll see what the next ISA um, says. And, you know, I just want to, you know, reiterate or remind everybody that, you know, while I will talk about premature mortality a lot, that is really just the tip of the iceberg. That's, of course, the most severe health outcome associated with air pollution. But there's a much larger proportion of the population that is experiencing less severe uh, health effects. So ER visits and hospital admissions and heart attacks and doctor's visits and school absences and lost work days, all the way to subclinical effects, things you may not even see a doctor for, lung function decrements, inflammation, cardiac effects. And so it is really a wide range of health outcomes that are associated with these air pollutants. This is what the current global distribution of PM 2.5 looks. Uh, this is, you can see that the highest PM 2.5 concentrations are in North Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. And that's, you know, for, in Northern Africa, a lot of that is driven by, by dust. Uh, South Asia is a variety of anthropogenic and non-anthropogenic non uh, sources. For um, China, we see actually it's a bit, sort of a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how uh, high PM 2.5 concentrations are. China used to have the highest concentrations in the world up until about 2010 when they declared a, a war on air pollution, and that's now dropped by about 40%. Um, in the United States and Europe, we have much lower levels, uh, but as you'll see on the right-hand side here, uh, the WHO guideline, the World Health Organization guideline, is five micrograms per meter cubed on an annual average basis, and nearly everyone in the world has concentrations that exceed that 
WHO guideline of five microrands per meter cubed. Um, so there's basically no one, very few people on the planet are breathing air that have uh, low enough levels of PM 2.5 that the air is safe to breathe. And so given that there's a wide variety of health outcomes associated with PM 2.5, and everyone on the planet is exposed to unsafe levels of PM2.5, it's perhaps not a surprise that air pollution is a leading global health risk factor. In fact, it is the fourth leading overall global health risk factor. That is not the fourth leading environmental risk factor. That's the fourth leading overall risk factor, just after high blood pressure, tobacco, and dietary risk. So this is not a fringe issue. It should not even be considered just an environmental issue. This needs to be central on the global health agenda and on the US health agenda. Let's talk about how climate change interacts with air pollution. So climate change is of course the, um, the, the most fundamental public health crisis that we are facing. It is a risk multiplier across the board. It would be very difficult to find any area of public health that is not touched or made worse by climate change. And so too, air pollution is. So uh, climate change can exacerbate ozone exposure. It can increase wildfire smoke. Um, we have increased dust concentrations that are being measured in the air as our Southwest of the United States gets more arid. Uh, worsening allergy conditions. We're seeing allergy season starting earlier and, um, and have sort of worse overall accumulated uh, pollen concentrations. And then airborne infectious disease. So you know, we're experiencing this right now with COVID-19, where there's a number of studies that are showing that air pollution exposure is actually worsening the health outcomes associated with those exposed and infected with SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, um, we have higher fatality rates uh, for COVID um, for, uh, higher, for people with higher air pollution exposure compared with lower air pollution exposure. I was asked by, with a, a number of colleagues by the EPA, a uh, few years back to help them understand how climate change will exacerbate future air pollution and what that means in terms of economic value. So um, at the time at, that I left the EPA, I used to work there, but when I left back in 2014, uh, there was only one way in which the uh, climate change impact on air pollution had been integrated into the national climate assessment, and that was the impact of climate change on ozone. But we knew, of course, that you know we were experiencing massive wildfire seasons and, like I said, dust storms in the southwest U.S. Um, we're expecting that climate change will exacerbate PM 2.5 in a number of different ways, and none of that had been included in the National Climate Assessment. And so we set out to estimate, and not just estimate, but value the number of lives and cases of disease that could uh, be exacerbated under severe climate change conditions compared with moderate climate, climate change conditions. Um, considering just the pathway through dust, ambient dust, and the pathway through wildfire PM 2.5. And um, you see here in the bubble chart, we use the same, the same computational setup, the same analytical chain, the same models and climate change scenarios as all these other sectors of society. So the labor impact, extreme temperature, mortality, and coastal property. And we found that wildfire PM 2.5 and uh, dust impacts on health, or if you add that together with the impacts of climate change on ozone, this is uh, on the same order of magnitude as the value of coastal property impacts of climate change. And so this is, again, the theme of this <laughs> talk maybe is, you know, this should not be a fringe issue. This, this the, health, the health damages of air pollution and climate change need to be center central to our decision making about how to mitigate climate change. And that's even an underestimate because we have done a review of the epidemiological evidence to determine whether or not there are synergistic effects of air pollution, temperature, and pollen exposure, which we might anticipate there being given that they affect the same biological system. And we found that there is overall moderate quality and sufficient evidence for synergistic effects of heat and air pollution. And so heat could actually make um, air pollution health risks worse and vice versa. We didn't have enough data for the links between whether or not there's a synergistic effect with pollen and either heat for both heat and air pollution. Um, but I think that as that literature continues to build, we may find something there. 
So we know that climate change and air quality interact in a lot of different ways. We talked about how climate change is exacerbating air pollution through changing meteorology and catalysis and that quote unquote natural emissions like wildfire smoke and, and dust. These are things that can no longer be considered natural because they're increasingly affected by anthropogenic climate change. And air pollution can also exacerbate climate change. We actually have some air pollutants that are climate warmers. Black carbon is one of them. It's a major component of diesel exhaust, um, at least for diesel vehicles that are not um, that are not certified to the latest standards. This is, these are particles that are very dark in color. So if you are driving behind like a big tractor trailer on the highway and you see this big cloud of black smoke, that's black carbon. And because of the dark color, it can absorb solar radiation and actually worsen climate change. But I want to talk about how we can actually address both of these problems simultaneously. So in the United States, we have mostly focused on this arrow here, pointing from emission sources to air quality. We have tried to break that arrow essentially by taking the emissions out of effluent streams with combustion processes. So again, we have put catalytic converters on our vehicles, we put diesel particulate filters on our trucks, we put scrubbers on our power plants, and those have led to very dramatic reductions in air pollution across the United States. I think of these as end of pipe controls, technological controls. And the problem with these controls, the very good thing about these controls is that they're pretty cheap. So we can continue the same you know, systems, urban systems that we have, we can use the same transportation system. All you have to do is slap an additional piece of machinery onto our vehicles and off we go. But it is continuing to contribute to climate change because these uh, technological controls are not reducing CO2 from the effluent stream. So in a sense, we have broken this arrow here from the emission sources to air pollution in the United States, but we are letting this arrow going from emission sources to climate change continue unabated. And as we talked about, since climate change is exacerbating air pollution, um, we, can actually, we cannot actually address our uh, air pollution levels and make them safe without also addressing climate change. And so we actually have to be targeting these emission sources at the source. We need to be reducing the amount of fuel that is burned, ideally fossil fuels, but also biofuels. Anytime we're reducing the amount of fuel that is burned, we are reducing both air pollutants and climate change and leading to health benefits. My group's work has focused a lot on urban areas, and the reason for that is because there's a lot of societal challenges happening simultaneously in urban areas. So we have poor air quality. Uh, cities globally are responsible for about 75% of CO2 emissions, and that's likely to grow as urbanization continues. Cities are experiencing dramatic health inequities. So this is just a, an example from the city I live in, Washington, D.C., where we have in the green color, um, on the like uh, underneath side of this plot, uh, showing pediatric asthma emergency department visit rates, and we see much higher asthma ED rates in the southeast quadrant of the city compared with the northwest. Um, and similarly, for life expectancy, we have about a 20-year life expectancy differential between neighborhoods in the southeast versus the northwest. And this lines up almost exactly with our map of racial segregation in the city, where we have a mostly black population on the eastern half and a mostly white population on the western half. And cities are expected to experience dramatic population growth. So we have about half the world's population right now lives in cities, and that's expected to grow to about two-thirds two by 2050. And nearly all of that growth is expected to happen in low and middle income countries. So we have sort of a confluence of risks and challenges here in urban areas of poor air quality, high CO2 emissions, health inequity, and population growth. And our ability to observe what levels of air pollution people are experiencing in cities has really dramatically improved over the past 15 years. That's at least since I've been paying attention. <laughs> I don't want to date myself too much, but this timeline starts back in 2004 when I was graduating college. And the leading estimate at the time was that there were 800,000 premature deaths associated with urban PM 2.5. And that was limited to just these urban areas where you see dots here, and that's where the ground monitors were located. And you can see much of the world is left unmonitored back in 2004. And so the authors of this study indicated that this was likely to be an underestimate because we're ex excluding rural areas and cities in much of the world. In my master's project, we decided to try to fill the gaps between the monitors by using a global chemical transport model. This is a, a very intense computer model that runs on a supercomputer. 
and it divides the world into grid cells or pixels, and we run a bunch of calculations, a bunch of equations in each grid cell to try to to try to estimate the levels of pollution in each uh, in each grid cell. And we found about a five-fold increase in the global burden of disease from PM 2.5, about 3.7 million premature deaths each year, uh, and developed the first estimate of the number of premature deaths associated with ozone each year, which was about 700,000. The problem with that approach was that each pixel was way too big to capture the co-location of urban populations with high concentrations. And so now the field has moved to using a combination of satellite observations, global chemical transport models that I used previously, and ground observations. And now what we're able to achieve is not just the full geospatial coverage so that we capture everybody, but we also have high spatial resolution, so we can pinpoint what is happening in urban areas. And in the future, I think this is just going to keep improving. We have actually launching later this year a new geostationary satellite. So um, the satellite fleet that we have right now that is capturing Earth observations or uh, measuring environmental qu qualities of the planet, um, those are mostly polar orbiting, so they're they're constantly going around the Earth and taking one snapshot per day uh, at about 1.30 p.m. on each location of Earth. The um, new satellite that, that NASA is launching called TEMPO will be geostationary, so it will hover just over the United States. As the Earth rotates, it will rotate with the Earth, and it's sort of like our weather satellites. Um, it will take hourly measurements of, of air pollution. And so our level of information is about to explode. Um, we are going to have really, really dramatic improvements in our knowledge of what people are exposed to. At the same time, we also have proliferating networks of low-cost sensors. So we actually have researchers and government agencies blanketing cities with uh, low-cost sensors. These are um, sensors that really cost only about like $100, $200, and you can put them up um, everywhere that you want around the city since they're so, you know, quote-unquote, cheap. Um, of course, it's not cheap depending on who you ask, but it is much cheaper than a federal grade uh, monitor, which costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and then mobile monitoring. So we have actually Google and um, some partners of Google mounting air quality sensors on Google Street View mapping cars and driving these cars street by street and measuring what people are exposed to at the street level. And I just have some question marks here as a marker for human ingenuity. We, of course, can't predict what we will come up with next, but given the dramatic evolution and exposure assessment for air pollution just over the last 15 years, I'm very optimistic that we are going to have really actionable information about air pollution levels for people all over the world. And so, you know, this, these images on the left-hand side here, these maps sort of show you how our understanding of PM 2.5 concentrations globally have evolved over time um, with this integrated approach where we use satellite data, we use low-cost, we use um, ground monitors, and we use uh, chemical transport models, and um, we have gotten really good at this. I will say that we still have some challenges and some limitations, but the data are getting pretty pretty good, um, and so now we can start to tease out what urban areas all around the world are experiencing, even in places where they have no um, air quality sensors at the ground. And so uh, this is a map that NASA created based on a study we just published in January showing the uh, change in PM 2.5 attributable mortality per 100,000 people between the years 2000 and 2019. And we can see a large increase in India and a large decrease in Europe and, um, and the US and so sort of a mixed bag everywhere else. Nitrogen dioxide is another pollutant of concern. And this is one I've been doing a lot of work on lately because this is one as opposed to PM 2.5, nitrogen dioxide has a much shorter residence time in the atmosphere, so it actually sticks really close to the sources. Um, so we can see actually a lot more variation within cities in terms of nitrogen dioxide compared with uh, PM 2.5. And nitrogen dioxide in cities is a marker of combustion, and more specifically, it's a marker of traffic-related air pollution. It's emitted every time we burn fuel. Um, and so in cities, traffic tends to be the largest source of nitrogen dioxide, and it is also uh, linked with pediatric asthma incident. That's not pediatric asthma exacerbation, but actually incident, the new development of asthma among children. And we found that in 125 major cities, the percent of new pediatric asthma cases that are attributable to NO2 ranged all the way up to 48%, and that was in Shanghai. 
And that means that in Shanghai, almost half of new pediatric asthma cases could be attributable to nitrogen dioxide. And you may think, okay, China is a very polluted place. Um, it's probably not that high in the United States. And yeah, it is not up to 48%, but it is a very concerning percentage. So let's just take a look at um, Los Angeles and New York City here in the high income category. Uh, they come in at about 33%. So about a third of new pediatric asthma cases in Los Angeles and New York City could be attributable to nitrogen dioxide. In DC, it's about a quarter. And so this percentage is very high. Uh, no matter where you go, uh, there's there's quite a range uh, between cities, but we see very high percentages in both high income cities and in other uh, regions of the world. We can actually now using satellite data explore trends over time as well in every city of the world. So we now, because we're covering the whole planet, we have high spatial resolution. We can actually tease out concentrations for 13,000 cities worldwide. Um, and so this is what a map of nitrogen dioxide concentration looks like in 2019. It's very different than PM 2.5. It's not just dominated like as PM 2.5 is by, um, by Northern Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. We see high pockets of NO2 in urban areas all over the world. They have been decreasing when you look at the bottom map here. They have been decreasing quite a bit in the U.S. and Europe as a result of air quality management programs and rising in South Asia. And again, in China, it's kind of a mixed bag as a result of their war on uh, their sort of dual war on air pollution combined with expansion of economic uh, fuel, com fuel combustion for economic growth. Um, and yet we see just looking at this bottom row here for the NO2 attributable fraction, that's the fraction of pediatric asthma incidence that is attributable to NO2 pollution. We see that in high income cities, that attributable fraction has been declining, while in South Asia, it has been rising. And at the same time, in the most recent year, the um, attributable fraction is still higher in high income cities than it is in South Asia. So this is not a, a problem that we have solved. We have now started looking at ozone as well, and we found something really interesting for ozone. So again, just like for PM 2.5 and NO2, we can calculate ozone concentrations and disease burdens for 13,000 cities uh, worldwide. But for ozone, we actually found the highest concentrations and the highest disease burdens in peri-urban areas, that's essentially suburban. So what happens is we have this interesting nonlinear atmospheric chemistry happening, where in the downtown urban core, we have a lot of NOx emissions. NOx is a precursor to ozone formation in the atmosphere. And that NOx, that very high amount of NOx emissions can actually eat up the ozone in a very nonlinear atmospheric chemistry process. We actually end up with depressed ozone concentrations in the downtown urban core and then higher concentrations about an hour downwind. So we have higher concentrations in um, this, these peri-urban areas worldwide. And interestingly, about 47% of the world's population lives in these peri-urban areas, but 56% of global ozone attributable deaths occur in these peri-urban areas. Um, so it's very different than uh, for PM 2.5 and for nitrogen dioxide. So we can actually, because we've now done these estimates of PM 2.5, ozone, and NO2 concentrations in 13,000 cities worldwide, we can estimate or calculate the, the percentage of cities that have concentrations that are over the latest World Health Organization guidelines. And I just take, a, I want to take a moment to tell you what those guidelines are because this is new. Uh, the WHO came out in late 2021 and really revived in a big way <laughs> their um, their uh, air quality guidelines. So it had been for annual average PM 2.5, the earlier WHO guideline was 10 micrograms per meter cubed and they cut that in half to five micrograms per meter cubed. For um, ozone, they created a new peak season um, guideline for ozone. And we don't even have a peak season uh, standard from the US EPA. So uh, our standard for ozone is is a short-term standard, and we're not right now protecting people from long-term repeated exposure to ozone. For nitrogen dioxide, the WHO guideline was dropped from 40 micrograms per meter cubed on an annual average basis to 10. And I just want to draw your attention to this US EPA column here. This is the current national ambient air quality standards, which are quite a bit looser for PM 2.5. There's it's 12 micrograms per meter cubed compared with five, uh, which is the World Health Organization guideline. For the ozone standard, um, our standard is 140 versus 100. Higher numbers indicate looser or less health protective. 
And then for nitrogen dioxide, the current national ambient air quality standard is 10 times larger than the World Health Organization guideline. Um, and our, our max for NO2 has not been revised since 1971, actually. So the US EPA standards are very much out of date with the current health literature, and I do hope that this um, current administration will tighten them, and I do expect that, that they will. Um, incidentally, a key advisory panel to the EPA just late last week recommended a value for the annual average PM2.5 max between 8 and 10 micrograms per meter cubed. So that would be better. Um, that would be tighter, but it still would not be as tight as the World Health Organization guidelines. So I want to talk about the natural experiment that our group has spent a while studying during COVID. And the reason for this is because we had sort of a triple unprecedented opportunity here. Um, and I don't want to make an opportunity of a pandemic that I wish we were not living through. But since we are living through it, um, we took the opportunity to study how air quality responded to people staying from home, staying home. And so the triple natural experiment here is that we had um, we had an unprecedented step change in human activity almost overnight. We have unprecedented ability to measure NO2 concentrations from space. This is the TROPOMI satellite sensor on the left-hand side here. It's actually a European instrument, and it has just incredible capability to, it can actually see individual power plants and really small sources of nitrogen dioxide, just really incredible capability of monitoring air pollution from space. Um, and then the third natural experiment, which I won't be talking about much today, is that we have differences in the makeup of our, of our vehicle markets across the world. So um, here in the United States, 97% of our passenger vehicles are powered by gasoline. On average in Europe, that's about 50% but it actually ranges quite a bit in Europe from about 10% to 70% depending on the country. So we can actually, uh, because diesels and gasoline uh, pollute by very different amounts, we can actually use that third sort of natural experiment, that difference in the makeup of our passenger vehicle market and what is fueling it around the world to explore how diesel versus gasoline is contributing to nitrogen dioxide uh, pollution in cities. So I'm mostly just going to be talking about the first two uh, natural experiments. One is the, um, the, you know, the fact that we had the step change in human activity when people started working from home during the pandemic. And the second is our unprecedented ability to measure air pollution from space with this TROPOMI satellite sensor. And so everywhere where you see blue on this map here is where nitrogen dioxide is observed from TROPOMI went down in 2020 versus 2019. And of course, this is as we expected, you know, people started working from home and we saw this drop in nitrogen dioxide. And yet something really concerning happened. We asked ourselves, and this had never been done before, so we did not anticipate what we would find at all. We thought maybe we would find nothing. Um, but we asked ourselves, could we use this natural experiment to explore air pollution inequities within cities? So this is work done by research scientists uh, working with me named Gage Kerr. And he used TROPOMI NO2 in, and he aggregated it to different spatial areas across the United States at the census tract scale. So let me just walk you through what this plot shows because I'm just flabbergasted every time I look at this plot. These top two bars here represent NO2 concentrations in all census tracts across the United States. The orange dots are for the least white census tracts and the blue dots are for the most white census tracts. And the solid connector lines are in the baseline period that's prior to the pandemic. So we saw in the baseline period as 2019, we had NO2 concentrations in the least white census tracts that were about double the concentrations in the most white census tracts. During the lockdowns, that's with the, the bars with the dashed connector lines, we saw both the orange dots and the blue dots shifted left. That indicates that NO2 dropped for both the least white and the most white census tracts. And yet, we still see that the least white census tracts had NO2 concentrations during the pandemic that exceeded the values in the most white census tracts prior to the pandemic. So what this indicates to me is that the inequities in NO2 concentrations prior to the pandemic were so large that even about a 50% drop in passenger vehicle traffic were, was not enough to erase those disparities. And we see that pattern for every major almost every major city across the United States and also holds for income and for educational attainment. 
But we wondered, you know, is this effect larger for by race, which I would expect it to be given our history of race-based policies in the United States, or is it larger by income or by educational attainment subcategories? So this is a, um, a project in progress led by Michael Cheeseman, who's a, a new PhD, a newly minted PhD graduate from Colorado State University. And he looked at NO2 concentrations on the left and PM 2.5 concentrations on the right for students across the United States. So he actually looked at concentrations at individual schools and grouped the schools according to those schools that had the most white students in purple versus the most non-white students in red. And on the x-axis here, we have the fraction of students that are eligible for subsidized meals. So this is a poverty indicator. The farther to the right you get, the more poverty there is. And I just want to note that at every single poverty level, the red bars are higher than the purple bars for both NO2 on the left and PN2.5 on the right. And that indicates that this is mostly an effect, this in inequity and pollution is mostly an effect of, of race and not an effect of poverty. And uh, we have in the United States an intersectionality problem. So you see this, uh, the size of these, these box plots get larger for the larger numbers of schools in, included in the data. Um, so we have a larger number of schools that have the most non-white students with the higher poverty levels um, compared with the lower poverty levels. So we have an intersectionality problem where the most non-white schools are also the highest, uh, that have the highest fraction of students with poverty. But we do see that every step along the way, it is the, um, it is the race factor that is driving the higher concentration. And of course, this is not a, this is not, definitely not a biological problem. Um, the concentrations actually have nothing to do with the people or, um, or biology. This is the result of histories of systemic racism in where people can live, where people can get loans to live, how close they live to highways and other polluting sources. So everything that I've shown so far is kind of comparing cities to each other, but I just want to take a look at what is going on within an individual city. So this is Washington, D.C., and we partnered with the D.C. Department of Energy and Environment and the D.C. Office of Health Equity, who noted that there is this 20-year life expectancy differential within the city of D.C., and we have this massive inequity in asthma ED visits, as I showed earlier, and they wanted to know how much is inequity in air pollution um, contributing to that health inequity that we're seeing. And so we partnered with them to estimate PM 2.5 attributable mortality at the neighborhood scale across the city. And perhaps not, the, not surprisingly, we found that the, uh, the, we found that the census tracts that had the highest PM 2.5 mortality rates also had the highest percent black in the neighborhood. And again, this map lines up almost exactly with a map of racial segregation in the city. Um, just to point out this, um, this neighborhood here in the Northwest quadrant, a very white quadrant, actually I used to live there. And the reason this comes out in hot pink is because it has a high PM 2.5 mortality rate and a low percent black. Um, the high PM 2.5 mortality rate in that neighborhood is because it's a, it's a very elderly population. So um, very high mortality rates in that, in that neighborhood. Uh, so this was, uh, this is a figure actually based on our paper that was created by NASA and it became the Earth Observatory image of the day on November 9th, 2021. Um, and it got picked up by social media and the public way more than our journal article did, of course, no surprise. Um, and uh, it even got picked up by an Instagram account with millions of followers called Washingtonian Probs, which honestly did not know about before they covered our uh, study. But um, I know that I should not do this. I should not read the comments on social media written about my research, but I did one day and there were hundreds and hundreds of comments and the most frequent one, drum roll please, was duh. So, you know, I think people, people know this and people know that air pollution is inequitably distributed, but I think having data to show it on a map like this is really valuable. And actually our DC partners are using the information they have funds available from their Volkswagen settlement funds. Remember Volkswagen Dieselgate, where the vehicles were emitting far more NOx in real world driving conditions compared with um, certification testing that was back in 2015. Uh, they have funds available from the settlement of that case. And 
this map can help them make decisions about where to spend those funds to reduce air pollution. And they can actually target, say, um, bus electrification for routes that are in these neighborhoods that are hardest hit in Southeast. We were asked to do a similar exercise for another city, St. Louis, that has a power plant right outside the city. And um, that power plant was grandfathered in the Clean Air Act and actually has no controls for SO2 emissions at all. Um, I actually did not know, maybe I'm naive, but I did not know that that still exists, that there are still coal-fired power plants across the United States that have no pollution control equipment for SO2. Um, you know, some of these plants have been operating since the 1950s. So uh, we wanted to know how much is the excess pollution from that plant contributing to health inequities within the city of St. Louis. And just as for, for Washington, we found that the least white communities had higher PM2.5 attributable mortality rates compared with the most white communities. And we found a similar pattern for the lowest and highest income communities. And we're now set up to do this really for any city, but we haven't done it because honestly, it's going to be the same picture over and over again maybe not that scientifically interesting, but very valuable to have for each individual city for, um, for helping to inform mitigation actions that can actually reduce these inequities. So just to turn back to this framework by which climate change and air pollution interact, um, you know, we talked about how climate change can exacerbate air pollution and how we have in the United States tried to break that arrow on the top left-hand quadrant here that goes from emission sources to air pollution and yet the arrow going from emission sources to climate change is still continuing unabated. We really need to be addressing emission sources at the source and burning less fuel. And when I say burn less fuel, it could be in any one of these sectors. So these are the four major sectors that are contributing to CO2 emissions and air pollution in the United States and around the world. We have electricity and heat production, transportation, industrial production, and agriculture, ag agriculture forestry, and land use. Now, if we're taking the view from a city government, you know, viewpoint, let's say you're Washington, D.C. I'll just I'll just pick on D.C. because I live here and I work with the people here, although it's pretty unfair because D.C. is actually out front in climate mitigation. But um, let's say you're Washington, D.C. and you're being asked to change your systems in the city so that they're not fossil fuel based anymore and they're polluting a lot less. The cost benefit analysis is all wrong because the, um, the costs are local and immediate, whereas the climate benefits are global and long term. And so the population does not want to necessarily undertake those expensive measures to cut CO2 uh, emissions because they're actually not seeing the rewards. Now, if we were to include the immediate air quality and health co benefits of reducing the amount of fuel that is burned for transportation or for electricity production or for, for industrial production. Yes, we would get those global long-term climate benefits, but we would also get immediate health benefits and air quality benefits that come that accrue to the local community, the taxpayers that are actually contributing to purchasing the, um, the, the mitigation measures. And so I had to laugh at this cartoon which came up in my Twitter feed not too long ago. It was originally from a USA Today cartoon back in 2009. Um, and you have, you know, th this debate has been ongoing for um, a frustratingly long time since I was a kid. Um, but you have this guy, kind of a climate skeptic and the audience of this IPCC, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change meeting. And he says, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? And, you know, the guy, the guy up front is listing all the benefits that would come from CO2 uh, mitigation approaches. And, you know, I have to say it is, um, I still see, it may seem kind of obvious that we would get many societal benefits from these mitigation approaches. And yet we still have much of our news media and discussion, policy discussions focused on the cost. So imagine if our conversation was not just about how expensive it is to shift away from fossil fuels to a cleaner society, but rather who's gonna get the benefits and how large are the benefits gonna be? And let's fight over how large those benefits are and you know, quantifying the benefits of different, of different uh, mitigation actions and, and approaches. And so we have in, in, in an effort to try to highlight those multiple benefits of greenhouse gas mitigation, we have uh, 
created a large conglomeration of people working together that involves researchers, what I think of as boundary organizations. These are organizations that span, span the science and the policy and local decision makers, local governments all over the world. And we have kind of a joint network, a joint project where we are helping these boundary organizations and local decision makers have data on the health benefits of different actions that they might take towards achieving carbon neutrality. And these, uh, the list on the bottom here is just some of the questions that came up that were asked of the researchers to look at, you know, what are the air pollution concentrations and disease burdens in cities? And I showed you that those data earlier. Um, how much are urban NOx and CO2 emissions changing in different cities as a result of uh, national policies, as well as urban um, actions, urban transitions, and economic development? And then what are the environmental health and equity co-benefits of urban climate action plans? And there's a lot of different pathways to achieving those co-benefits. So we wrote a review of which of these pathways do we have enough information about to actually do quantitative health risk assessment um, and health benefits assessment um, at the urban scale. And we focused on air pollution, green space, noise, and physical activity. And all of these would result from climate, from CO2 mitigation actions implemented in cities. And they have a range of health benefits, including for reducing mortality and cardiovascular disease and mental health outcomes, reproductive health outcomes, and respiratory disease. And we actually found that all of these have enough quantitative information from the epidemiological literature to be considering in risk assessments for cities. So we wanted to know how many cities are already accounting for this, these co-benefits. So we did a qualitative review of climate action plans from 27 C40 member cities on all continents. Um, this is under review right now. And we looked at the references that each of these climate action plans made to the health effects of climate change, the health co-benefits of mitigating climate change, exposures, different types of environmental exposures, and equity. And the cities really range quite widely in terms of the fraction of their document, of their climate action plan that they used to refer to these four concepts. But for the most part, um, of the four categories that we coded, 57% um, referred to exposure to environmental health risk factors, 21% to equity, 15% to health co-benefits of greenhouse gas mitigation, and only 7% to health effects of climate change. And we look at the different types of exposures on the left. It's actually a really healthy mix. Only a couple cities, though, mentioned vector-borne disease and waterborne disease, but there was a lot of airtime to heat and air quality and disasters and green space and physical activity. That was actually really nice to see a, a real mix of different types of exposures that were considered in these climate action plans. In terms of the health impacts and co-benefits, though, on the right, we see this uh, teal color come up in terms of the majority of the references in both health impacts and health co-benefits, and that's just the, a general health category. So the, health, the, the climate action plan might have said something like expanding green space in uh, our city will also lead to health benefits, um, rather than indicating a particular health outcome that might be affected, like infectious disease or mental health or physical fitness. And so we wanted to help cities address air quality and health benefits in their climate action plans. And so we partnered directly with C40 cities in their climate action planning program. And we have now integrated air quality and health in a quantitative way in six pilot cities for their climate action plans. This is a real, real graph that I just, a screenshot from the climate action plans for Buenos Aires in the top left and Johannesburg on the bottom right. And we see that for Buenos Aires, they were able to calculate that PM 2.5 concentrations were about 12 micrograms per meter cubed in 2050 under a base scenario, and that would drop to about eight micrograms per meter cubed under an ambitious greenhouse gas mitigation scenario. Johannesburg took a little bit of a different approach where they wanted to look at individual um, mitigation options and look at the dual benefit for the percent of total PM 2.5 concentration reduction on the x-axis and the percent of total CO2 emission reduction on the y. And we see that there are some actions that get a lot of CO2 emission reductions, like grid electricity decarbonization, and other mitigation actions get a lot of PM 2.5 concentration reductions, but no CO2 emission reductions. An example of that would be fuel switch for industrial processes. 
Um, mode shift from on-road vehicles came out as sort of the best dually beneficial in terms of achieving both PM 2.5 and CO2 emission reduction. So a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I want to reiterate my key point that air pollution continues to place a large burden on public health globally and in the U.S., that this risk, the health risks from air pollution varies within cities and that contributes to health inequity that we're, um, that we're experiencing in, in many U.S. cities. Climate change is exacerbating air pollution, so that may worsen air pollution in the future. And it, this is the opportunity now. The good news story is if we can shift from engineering control to reducing fuel combustion in the first place, that would not only benefit the global climate over centuries, but it would have many local and immediate benefits for environmental quality and public health. And I just want to make one final note that you know the, the health sector has a really critical role to play. So when you go back to this uh, this eight year old child again who um, was asthmatic and her uh, her death was brought forward many years by air pollution, what questions did her doctors ask? You know her foundation, her family's foundation, has indicated that she saw many uh, doctors over the course of her childhood. Did they ask what are the air quality levels in the places where she spent her time? Did they ask whether she lived near a highway, airport, shipping bus, shipping port, bus terminal, power plant, or an industrial plant? Did she ask about the political, did they ask about the political and structural systems that were enabling those sources to release high levels of air pollutants where she lived? And you know, this what it all boils down to me is why are children being forced to breathe air that is so bad for them? Um, I hate to put it in such such stark terms, but as I'm a mom to three children myself, it's becoming a, a very uh, a, a question that hits very close to home to me, at least. I do want to make the point that nurses and doctors are the most trusted source. And so if for clinicians who may be doing individual patient care and wondering, how can I really get engaged in climate change? This is a population problem. It's not necessarily um, so concrete for each individual patient that I see. Just consider the fact that you really are a uh, trusted source. And so getting information um, from you uh, as opposed to, say, social media or um, the uh, cable news um, uh, would be much more impactful. And just to say, you know, finally, if not you, who? These are real health emergencies. And the and tra transitioning away from fossil fuels has many health co-benefits, but some are more beneficial than, than others. And yet health is really largely missing from climate policy discussion. And it is really health sector engagement and advocacy that is really essential for bringing that health and equity lens that is so missing from our climate policy debate. Um, and luckily there are many um, organizations where Clinicians are joining together to advocate, um, and thank you all for all that that you are doing in that in that space. Um, and so I'm very happy to uh, continue to connect with you and be a resource to you if I can. Thank you.